great. All right. So theory is is a, 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 a topic that I have been um, interested in for much of my academic uh, a career. Uh, even the early days of, of, uh, of my PhD, um, perhaps one of the, the, the best courses that I ever took was the sociology of knowledge, uh, which, which has a long conversation about um, what, what the, the essence of knowledge is in, in terms of social theory and scientific theory. Um, apologies, I've got things coming up on my screen. Um, and, and, and that extended into my uh, primary interest uh, empirically, which was the, the professions. And, and uh, much of what I'm gonna talk about draws from that, that, uh, that history about the role of, of uh, abstract theory, abstract knowledge in, in the formation of the, the jurisdiction of uh, professions. And of course, uh, like, like uh, any other knowledge pursuit, uh, academia and, and management is, uh, uh, we, we shouldn't forget is, is a, a profession. One of the, the points that I'll keep coming back to though is, and, and I think uh, Dean Shepard and I wrote about this in a paper that was published in 2017, that, that ultimately uh, all theory is, is uh, a narrative in its, in its formation and good theory is a, is a, is a good story. And these, these good stories are, are built on analogies. And so one of the analogies that I'm going to, to build up through this is the, the role of the alchemist. And, and the, the, the key takeaway that I think uh, that, that, that I would like you to have from this conversation is uh, that we, we, we have to figure out what sort of profession we are, what sort of knowledge mandate uh, we aspire to as a, as a profession. And I think historically we could learn a lot from from the alchemists. I know that sounds weird, but uh, hopefully as we as we go on, that will um, become somewhat clearer. So I I, I see uh, Elena is in the audience, and Elena will appreciate uh, this uh, reference back to uh, the. The, the origins of all knowledge in the Western canon, uh, at least as, as uh, Harold Bloom would say, is uh, from what we've learned from the ancient Greeks. And the, the, the term theory, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, comes from, from uh, a Greek philosophy. They, they use this term theoria, which is this idea of, um, of contemplation, of, of looking at, uh, that is this idea of, of theater, the term theater comes from uh, the same the same Greek root, but looking at is the empirical component of theory, and um, there there are other ways of of knowing beyond empiricism, that is looking at whether of the eyes or of of the mind, and that notion of of theory um, permeates of course early Christianity, where the, the the notion of theory was this unmediated vision of of God. In fact, uh, Saint Augustine identified three types of visions, which are roughly translated into three types of, of knowing. Corporeal, which is the, the, the knowledge of the world. That is the, what we, we understand to be empirical knowledge or scientific knowledge in, in modern parlance. There is spiritual knowledge. And then there's this very, very high form of knowledge that, that we, we term uh, theoria or theory. And, and, and true theory in, in, in their view was very, very rare. It, it's obviously the goal of, of all seeing these idea of ecstatic prophetic visions in, in the Bible, but even, even those visions, the visions of Moses and Ezekiel and Isaiah, they didn't really aspire to, to theory because uh, they, they never approached God, they, they, they approached the, the, the likeness of God. Uh, the, the, the burning bush rather than visions of, of God. So, so that there was this inherent notion that theory was a higher form of seeing well beyond empiricism, obviously beyond phenomenology or spirituality. And it was, uh, as, as Mary Carruthers in The Craft of Thought refers to it, it was, it was this no, form of knowing that could only be achieved by deep, deep internal meditation, contemplative practice that allows one uh, to see the, the, the face of God. So what we do uh, when we look at these notions of different ways of knowing through a single lens, which is what 
what we tend to do in, uh, in management theory, and that lens happens to be scientific theory, is that we take these abstract phenomenological ideas and these spiritual ideas and we secularize them, we rationalize them, and uh, we, we reduce them. And the best example I, I, I came across was uh, a recent uh, study. This is a, a, a neuroscientist scientific study done by Beauregard and Paquette in, in 2006. And um, they, they um, had, a, had a, 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 an interest in understanding um, this, this notion of the union of God um, and, and how it affect neurological functions uh, by looking at, at Carmelite nuns. This was a study done in, in Quebec in, in Canada. And I'm, I'm just gonna read the, the, the uh, summary of the study from the abstract to give you a sense of what it, what it seems like when we, when we take abstract notions of knowledge and try and reduce it to empirical knowledge. Here are the main findings of the study. The brain activity of Carmelite nuns was measured while they were subjectively in union with God. This state was associated with significant loci of activity in the right medial orbit, orbital frontal cortex, right middle temporal context, right inferior and superior lobules, right caudate, left medial prefrontal cortex, left anterior cingulate cortex, left parietal lobule, left insula, left caudate, and left brainstem. Other loci of activation were seen in the extrastriate visual cortex. These results suggest that mystical experiences are mediated by several brain regions and, and systems. So what we're seeing here is two forms of, of knowing, the knowing of the Carmelite nuns and the knowing of the, of the, the CT scans uh, done by the, 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 the scientists. And, and the, the real interesting question for us is which, which way of knowing, and, and this is a very scientific um, a question to ask, which way of knowing is, is, is better? Which way of knowing is more interesting? Which way of knowing gives you insight uh, to, to truth? Uh, and, and a more interesting question for me is, how do these ways of knowing, the, the spiritual way of knowing and the, and the scientific way of knowing, how do they mediate each other? What, what, what terms of correspondence do they have that we can, we can understand? And I want to, 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 to plant this, this notion of the Carmelite nuns being studied by scientists in the back of your head, because we're gonna come back to this um, later, later on in, in the talk. So theory in the, in the context of, of management uh, and, and uh, management as a profession uh, has, has been quite problematic for us. We spend a lot of time uh, talking about, about theory but we have a, a really awkward understanding of what theory is. And, and we have a, 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 an incredibly awkward relationship with, with theory. And in fact, quite recently, um, there, there has been perhaps a, a, an even greater challenge to the legitimacy of theory in, in management than, than we've ever had since uh, the, the late 1990s when there, the, the postmodern turn was on and there was a, a proliferation of, of arguments about uh, the appropriateness of, of ways of knowing. Uh, and back then, uh, Jeff Pfeffer came out with this idea that uh, there are too many theories, we need to settle down and get, get to, to our scientific business. That, that conversation was revisited with a, 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 an editorial piece published by Don Hambrick in 2007 saying that there's, there's just too much theory. We need, we need more data, we need um, less, less theory. Um, Reins, Bartunek, and Daft, uh, in between those two uh, pieces, argued that, that theory, that we aren't attending enough to the, the practitioner world and, and the, the, the convoluted language that we use in theory is actually an impediment to um, communicating to practitioners and it actually impedes knowledge transfer uh, within, within um, academic groups. And one of the, the proposals suggested by Davis and Marcus is that we, we, need to, we need to move away from the big story, the grand narrative of theory, and uh, perhaps look at, at more uh, manageable, more bite-sized uh, models of, of, uh, of what we do. So, 
background uh, to 2010, I, 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 I uh, was invited by the then editor of, um, of the Academy of Management Review. Uh, this was Martin Kilduff. Uh, every 10 years, every decade, they do a special issue on, on uh, theory. And uh, he, he'd asked me to organize a, um, uh, the, 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 the decanal um, special issue on, uh, on theory. And after some conversation, we, we came to the, the, the conclusion that it might be interesting to look at um, why it is that, that we were still uh, relying uh, in management on theories that were largely developed in in business schools in the 1960s and the 1970s. And that was true for organizational theory, uh, the, the more macro element of, of our knowledge base and uh, for organizational uh, be behavior. And the, the observation that we had that by 2010, 2011, when this, this special issue call was to be made, that the world of, of business and management had changed quite substantially since the 1960s and 1970s. And, and the real question was, um, why haven't we updated our, our, our theories? So we, we put out this call to uh, suggest that, that uh, we, we, we want some new theories, theories that, uh, that better reflect the, the uh, phenomenological state or the phenomenal state of the, of the, of the world that we uh, occupy. And one of the arguments we were making in this, in this proposal was that uh, our theories demonstrate a high degree of, of inertia, what the physicists call hysteresis, that there is this lag effect. Um, so hysteresis refers to the fact that when you uh, attach a magnetic force to an object, even after the magnet gets removed, the magnetic effect remains for a long time, this, this lag effect of, of, of what is happening. And, and our, our, our sense was that the same thing is happening uh, with theory, even though the empirical phenomenon that, that drove much of the theory building in the 1960s and 1970s uh, had been altered, uh, the, the reality was that the, the, um, the, the, the theories uh, sort of had this, this high degree of, of stubborn persistence. So we were very optimistic on this call. We thought, this is great. We're going to get a new theory. What, what did we get? Um, well, we certainly didn't get any new theories in, in the call. And I think in, in our, our um, uh, introduction to the special issue, we, we pointed that out. But what we got in, in, in and, and, and our hope was that we were gonna get, if, if, we, if we take the, the notion that theory and stories are, are roughly equivalent, we didn't get any new stories. We didn't get any um, new ideas in the sense, but we got new ways to, Actually, we didn't even get new ways to tell the story. What we got were rationalized and scientific descriptions of the best way to tell a story. We got the, the, the uh, papers on how to generate a theoretical gap, how to craft a theory paper, how to organize a proper literature review. Do you do it in typologies or in typographies? Uh, how do you create a, a motivation for the paper? How do you use metaphors and analogies in in, it, it was as if we got a, a how-to manual on, on how to write a screenplay, which, which, is, which is an interesting observation in the sense that uh, one of the concerns I have uh, expressed earlier was this scientific reduction of, of abstract phenomenal uh, as a, a, a tendency in um, taking a unified way of, of knowing. But we also tend to drift toward highly formulaic and algorithmic ways of, of telling the story. And in fact, we're, we're more than happy to uh, elaborate in, in, a, in a very, very descriptive way uh, precisely what those, those stories should look like. So, so what, what we are drifting to in this, uh, back again to the Carmelite nuns, is, is this common thread uh, that all of the critics of, of the role of theory in management scholarship are arguing that our present conception of theory isn't scientific enough. So again, Hamburg too much, Pfeffer too many, knowledge transfer mechanisms, they're, they're, they're all saying that we need more rationalist, reductionist approaches to our, our understanding of, of theory. And 
in our response to the uh, call for papers in the special issue, we were also getting the story that we need rationalist, reductionist ways of presenting our, our theory that are, that are internally and, uh, and externally consistent. In all of these cases, the, the, the critics justify their need for the reductionist and uh, rather the more scientific approach to, to um, presenting theory as um, a, a claim on our professional knowledge mandate. We aren't professional unless we look like scientists is the argument. And, and our theories aren't professional unless they operate in the same way as, as scientific theories do. They, they, they see theory and, and the knowledge mandate of theory in management in uh, a, a very precise way. And that is that theory summarizes knowledge. It is a, a, a way of, of, uh, of sedimenting knowledge. An inherent subsidiary assumption of that is that knowledge is, is cumulative, that there is a, a form of progression in knowledge that we need to understand. And, and that's obviously summarized in this very famous uh, phrase of Sir Isaac Newton, which uh, appears on the, on the Google webpage uh, periodically. We stand on the shoulders of giants. That, that is the assumption there. They also see theory as a mechanism for uh, legitimacy of the profession, a form of, of jurisdictional protection. So there's a careerist interest in having a, a scientific a notion of of, uh, of, of theory. And, the, and this careerist notion is based on mimetic isomorphism. Scientists have legitimate knowledge, so we, we need to have a, a similar form of knowledge. And that, of course, is, is reinforced in, in uh, Andy Abbott's uh, very famous book on the system of, of professions, where he points out historically to the relative success of physics as a, a scientific knowledge mandate uh, because they had abstract theory and a, a, a relative uh, lack of success of uh, engineers. And the, the, the engineer on the, on the, so Einstein, everyone recognizes, we probably don't recognize the engineer on the slide, but that is, uh, that is uh, uh, Brunel, is, is Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who is one of the, the more famous um, um, engineers of, of uh, of Victorian England. He created the Great Western Railway, built the first tunnel under the Thames. He made the first propeller-driven uh, iron ship. Uh, very, very accomplished uh, engineer, but, but one who, apart from his name on objects and universities, is not nearly as famous or, um, or whose knowledge is not nearly as, uh, as legitimately perceived as, as, as that of, of Albert Einstein. And the argument that uh, Andy Abbott makes for that is the, the, the difference is theory. But the abstract theory of the physicists allowed them to adapt their knowledge to changing circumstances in a way that, that engineers um, did not. And, and there, is a, there is a cautionary tale in, in, in Abbott's story uh, for um, our understanding of uh, our, our role of theory because um, and and um, I hope I can elaborate this um, sufficiently clearly. Clearly, um, the the need to summarize knowledge and to need to use knowledge as a means of jurisdictional protection are only two mandates of of, uh, of abstract theory, and there are actually a lot more um, a lot more opportunities. Uh, so so how is our professional knowledge mandate as a, a scientific profession working out? Well, the, the, the answer is it's, it's not working out uh, particularly well at, at all. Um, we are quite aware of the, the uh, crises of legitimacy in management education that is driven largely on arguments that our, our knowledge mandate doesn't fit um, what, uh, what, what the profession and what society particularly needs at, at the time. So we do see that the MBA programs, which is one of our, actually these are not MBA statistics, these are business school statistics from uh, the US News and World Report show that uh, enrollment in business school is falling. We, we have uh, all sorts of ethical scandals uh, in, involved from um, uh, uh, individuals in, and corporate executives many of whom are trained at our elite business schools, 
um, that uh, that cast a shadow on the on the ethical value of the knowledge that we're producing. Uh, internally, we complain uh, that that the the theories and and uh, uh, knowledge that we produce are, are recycled fads and fashions that keep uh, appearing and, and reappearing uh, over time. Uh, the, the assumption in all of this is that there is a, a, an ethical and moral failure in our knowledge and uh, that our theories are uh, really just borrowed theories or theories that um, do not uh, accurately uh, descri describe uh, reality. So, so the question then becomes is, is how do we explain internally the ethical failure of business schools and by implication, the, um, the ethical failure of, of, our, of our knowledge mandates. And, and so we have a, 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 a series of uh, um, very, very powerful critiques of, of our knowledge base and a very powerful critiques of our claim to professionalism. And the one thing in common uh, for, for all of these critics is that they say that we have abandoned our, profession, our, our mission of, of professionalism. But, but they're, they're arguing about professionalism in, in slightly different ways that, that uh, are important to the message that I'd, I'd, I'd like to convey. So Rakesh Kurana does this wonderful, uh, again, historical account of uh, the, the changing mandate of, of business schools. And, and his argument uh, basically is that our, our, our failure professionally is that uh, we, it's a normative failure. We don't teach ethics in the professional way that, that uh, we ought to, and uh, he would argue that we once uh, used to. Warren Bennis, uh, uh, of course, uh, an expert in, in leadership, uh, suggests that business schools need to develop uh, character. And, and our biggest failure is that we have, we have failed to, to build character. Um, Henry Mintzberg's argument is that our professional failure is that we've, we've actually failed to build on the, the, the practical experience and the idea that the knowledge that we produce is not universal, but needs to be adapted to, to the, the exigencies of uh, different types of, of, of businesses. Also a professional failure, he would say. And, and Chris Quintrank and Sarah Rines in a, a, a nice paper in AMLE uh, argue uh, that we we have uh, we have failed in our ability to generate abstract knowledge, and that we tend to we tend to teach uh, aphorisms uh, rather than uh, abstract knowledge as dictated by a, a scientific uh, profession. They all share the assumption that our failure is a failure to uh, treat management knowledge in a in a professional way, but Implicitly, they are talking about uh, different forms of, of professions. And let me take the two extremes to demonstrate what I mean by that. So, so absolutely, I agree that professionalism has been lost, but which form of professionalism? Well, in as much as we argue through analogy, uh, each of these, these folks has different, different types of understanding of what, um, or, or a different implicit analogy of the ideal type profession. So Karana in, in his note uh, or his observation that we're failing normatively and that we're failing uh, ethically, his, his implicit understanding of the ideal type profession is law. And uh, Quintrank and Rhines in saying that we lack an abstract universal knowledge that can be used in practice, their implicit understanding of the ideal type profession is, is medicine. Um, are either of those absolutely accurate for the knowledge mandate that we as, as uh, business uh, professionals have? Well, the answer according to, to Halliday, also a sociologist of, of the professions, and, and he, he talks quite explicitly about three different types of, of knowledge mandates, uh, uh, normative, uh, scientific, Normative is exemplified by law, scientific is exemplified by medicine, and an, an intermediate or interstitial element of uh, knowledge called uh, a syncretic knowledge mandate, which he indicates is exemplified by uh, the military. He also argues it's exemplified by academia more, more broadly, uh, but I would suggest that that uh, it it most uh, specifically applies to the context of 
of, uh, of what we do in, in the business school. Let me just describe a little bit what Halliday says about the, the, the epistemological basis of syncretic knowledge in, in the military. What he says is the core of military experiences now, uh, or sorry, the, the, the core of military expertise comprises an amalgam of both scientific and normative elements. Science and technology are the central component of armaments and, and arms. And, and he points out that, the, the, that because of that, the private sector is largely the source of that expertise. But the military also has a normative mandate. They have, uh, they have their own engineers, they have their own experts on, on uh, the application and, and use of the um, armaments that they have because of the moral and political component of what they do. And they point out that successful militaries, the elite institutions that we see at West Point and Sandhurst, in spite of their own internal moral failures periodically, have been successful because they approach military training uh, as a syncretic profession, where not only do these people get trained in, in the sciences, but they also get trained in history, in political science, in normative values and ethics, and uh, in, in, all, in all aspects of the, of the humanities. Uh, the, the, the moral and normative discourse, according to uh, uh, Halliday, has to be integrated seamlessly with the technical and scientific knowledge of, uh, of uh, the, 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 the form of knowing that we typically associate with, uh, with uh, professionalism in the, modern, in the modern era. Now, here's where we come to the, the, the allegory that I think or the analogy, I think, that uh, may, may be a little bit uh, controversial. And that is, as a syncretic profession, we should not look to uh, science as the source or law as the source uh, uh, template or the foundational idea of uh, who we are as a profession. Instead, I think we need to look to, to the alchemists, because the alchemists occupy this interstitial space between uh, normative and scientific knowledge mandates. The normative uh, knowledge mandate, of course, is exemplified not necessarily by law, but originally by uh, religion. And in fact, while we tend to see the distinction today between religion and science as being very, very hard, historically, uh, it is a continuum. They, they flow into each other. There is no hard historical breach between um, now we're religious people, and uh, soon we're going to become science, scientists. Uh, the, the reality is that there was this interstitial stage of, of alchemy populated by many people who we now uh, recognize uh, only as, as uh, scientists. Uh, Isaac Newton fiddled with uh, alchemy. Uh, Sir Robert Boyle also fiddled with uh, alchemy. But in this uh, profound mechanism we have of institutionalized forgetting, um, the, the, the alchemical elements of, uh, and the religious elements, I would add, of, of, uh, of what they were doing um, have been um, very, very interestingly and strategically uh, erased from, from our history books. Not, not all of them, um, but, but it is this, this alchemical knowledge that serves as a historical bridge between religion and science. And, and as a result of that, it, it serves as a, a, a very useful um, metaphor for understanding the forms of theory and the forms of knowledge mandates that I think that we need as a, a profession. And um, I'll, I'll bring out a little bit more about the history of, of, uh, of alchemy and, and particularly of, of those two individuals, but I, I, I want to uh, first uh, describe a little bit about the, 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 the various ways in which our knowledge is, is alchemical rather than uh, purely scientific or, or purely normative. And I have these uh, four elements of, uh, of alchemical knowledge that uh, translates to a management uh, mandate that I'll, I'll talk about. The, the first one, of course, is this idea that, that um, alchemical knowledge is multidisciplinary. It is, it is inclusive rather than, it, it, it enjoys multiple ways of knowing and promotes multiple ways of knowing uh, rather than the, the, the very narrow ways of knowing that uh, are argued by the critics of theory and management 
and uh, that uh, there is this tendency toward in, in scientific ways of knowing. So the ancient Greeks, of course, were, were very, very uh, suspicious of uh, a single way of knowing. And they were very, very uh, suspicious of epistemic knowledge, which is the closest uh, thing, the category that they have to, to um, scientific knowledge. Uh, and, and instead they, they suggested that true wisdom arises from knowledge that comes from a variety of ways of knowing. And the, what, the ones that I'm going to mention here very briefly are not the only ways of knowing that they celebrated, but they uh, do tend to be the the primary ones. So this is epistemic knowledge. It's the universal knowledge of the world. Um, and and the, the, the important part of that is knowledge of the world. It's not knowledge of, of, uh, of, of human nature. Uh, and it certainly isn't knowledge of, uh, the, the, of the gods. Uh, it is based entirely on empirical observation. It is reductionist. It is deductive. It is everything that uh, the, the uh, study of the Carmelite nuns is, is, is about. And the purest form of, of complete abstract deduction to them, of course, is the knowledge of, of geometry, uh, which, which has this um, internal symmetry that has been used uh, over, over thousands of years now to develop all sorts of all types of forms of, of new knowledge. So this is not to denigrate uh, epistemic knowledge. Uh, there, there is incredible value. In, in this form of uh, reductionist knowing. But again, it is not the, the only way of knowing. And uh, the, the, um, the Greeks were highly suspicious of using only epistemic knowledge to understanding the world because the gods, of course, could, could uh, transform into different material forms. Uh, so in order to have complete knowledge, you, you had to uh, in, incorporate um, metaphysical forms or ways of knowing. They also encourage technical knowledge or uh, knowledge through art or craft technique, which is the, the precise argument that Henry Mintzberg has made about the, the, the failures in, in our profession. Um, he, he argues that, uh, that uh, in, in this wonderful paper about crafting strategy, he uses the analogy of, of the, the pottery maker to understand uh, the, the nuanced degree of feedback that that business managers need to, to have uh, to uh, acquire uh, localized knowledge of a, a particular business uh, situation. Uh, phrenesis, this of course is a, a picture of uh, uh, the, the wisdom of, of Solomon making a, a decision about whose baby is, is which. Uh, and uh, uh, th this, this notion of phrenesis is a, a kind of, um, a kind of expertise that is based on a, a degree of practical wisdom, uh, mindfulness, judgment, notions of character. Uh, that's, that's another way of knowing that is separate from that. New is the knowledge of the, uh, the intellect and reason, but it's a, a degree of knowledge, much like the, the, the notions of tiers of knowledge that, um, that uh, St. Augustine spoke about. Uh, it, it's an abstract form of knowledge that, that uh, is, is not just uh, about ways of knowing the world, but uh, ways that, uh, of, of knowing humanity. What can science tell us about love, beauty, truth, or freedom? These are, these are abstract constructs that um, science um, re really, really struggles to capture because they're not uh, reductionist terms as, uh, as we understand them. Sophia is the devotion to truth, uh, roughly approximates our discussions of reflexivity in, in knowledge, um, but it includes as well uh, this idea of epistemic humility, that an awareness of that, that all of our knowledge is temporary. Depending on the time scan that you're looking at, uh, the world is always changing, and as a result, our knowledge uh, must always be considered to be uh, contingent. So, so that's, that's the, 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 the interdisciplinary uh, element of, of knowledge. And, and one of the things that the application of science to the sociology of knowledge is, is starting to determine uh, is the truth of, of the, the need for multidisciplinary ways of, of knowing. And, and one of the outcomes that we have from this is this idea that if we want to generate new ideas, reductionism is not the way to do it, but rather we need to look at knowledge that emerges at the intersection of different ways of, of knowing. 
And this was demonstrated quite eloquently by a paper by Brian Uzi and colleagues that looks at, uh, it published in, in Science in 2013, and it looks at atypical combinations of knowledge. And they did a, a, a very systematic and uh, incredibly comprehensive uh, content analysis of 17.9 million papers covering all scientific fields. And they, they suggest there that, that uh, generative science follows a nearly universal pattern. The highest impact scientific discoveries tend to come from uh, conventional combinations of prior work that exist in, in, in different areas. They, they come together in uh, what they type as atypical combinations. And papers of that type are twice as highly to be cited as uh, more uh, traditional works. And novel combinations of prior works uh, are um, uh, often done by multidisciplinary teams of authors rather than, than sole authors. Here's another study that says that roughly the same thing in a slightly different way by Lee and colleagues uh, just, just recently published. And they did a, a comprehensive data set about the educational backgrounds of all the Nobel awardees in, uh, in, in medicine. And they focused on their undergraduate study and their doctoral majors. And in over half of the cases, the laureates of Nobel Prizes in medicine had multidisciplinary educational backgrounds. Seven, nearly 70% of their undergraduate majors were not directly um, engaged in medicine. Now recall the conversation that we, we just had about, uh, about the uh, syncretic forms of knowledge in, in the military, that a successful military is trained not just in the technical aspects of warfare, but in the normative aspects of warfare that integrates humanities and science, um, we're, we're seeing the same reflection of exactly that uh, there. This, this idea of different forms of knowledge and the multidisciplinary nature of knowledge and the repetition of different ideas across different types of knowledge was captured in Andy Abbott's book, The Chaos of Discipline. He uses the analogy of fractals from physics to, to explain how this tends to occur in in the social sciences, that knowledge in different disciplines is organized around common oppositions that function at all kinds of levels in a, in a theory. And he also argues that this extends uh, to, to methods as well. And, and he shows that most objects of study in the social sciences show this, this degree of these binary splits that repeat themselves over and over again at, at different levels within a, a, a paradigmatic field. So the, 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 the tension between culture and structure, this, uh, this uh, idea of uh, um, the, 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 uh, the, the difference between, uh, you know, what is, what is the, the, the foundation or the, the base versus the superstructure of, of uh, social knowledge? Is it, is, it, uh, is it structural or is it cultural in nature? That, that repeats itself uh, all the way through the social sciences. And I, I, I won't elaborate it here, but uh, if you're interested in that, um, he, he, uh, Abbott does a, a masterful job of demonstrating this, not just this particularly uh, binary fractal, but, uh, but, 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 a, but a whole range of them. In, in fact, when, when, when I teach organizational theory, I tend to, to use Abbott's framework to, to understand many of the, the fractal conversations that are going on in macro organizational theory, for example. And if you look at the history of organizational theory, uh, the bureaucratic through school of Max Weber, the behavioral school that comes out of the Carnegie and Mellon folks and, and on and on, what you see is a fractal, a, a fractal uh, iteration uh, between the question of where is agency? in the structure of organizations. Does agency rest in the organization, in the individuals in the organization, or does agency rest in the environment? And we keep flip-flopping back and forth on, on, on that, uh, that particular question over time. Uh, a, a similar fractal, fractal approach uh, occurs in microcosm within the context of institutional theory. If you look at the history of institutional theory, which starts with and there are so many different types of institutional theory now, it's, it's hard to keep track of them, but you go from old institutionalism to neo-institutionalism to institutional entrepreneurship, to institutional logics, and then to institutional work. 
The actors have agency. No, they don't. Yes, they do. No, they don't. And I know that I'm going to get beat up on that. Oh, we have a nuanced view of agency. No, 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 we don't. The, 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 the big argument is either we have agency or we don't. And it keeps flip-flopping between. And I'm not, I'm not saying that that is the only um, uh, fractal conversation or fractal narrative that's going on in institutional theory. There are others, of course. Uh, but that seems to be the dominant one, which we've, uh, as as uh, Abbott would say, we have we have borrowed that uh, conversation, that that fractal notion of of, of theory uh, from organizational theory. Third component that uh, we, we need to understand of of alchemical theory is that it it is transcendent, not not secular. And uh, again, I, I I made the point that uh, Dean Shepard and I uh, published this idea that uh, all social theories are, are structured as stories, and all of these stories make some claim about the essence of, of, uh, of human nature, particularly in social theory, but I think there's an element of that in, in scientific theory. These, these stories create meta-narratives or myths that give the theory coherence, and, and we, we don't do a good job in our profession of trying to understand what the meta-narrative of these different theories are. And again, the, the, the framing that I'm borrowing here are from uh, the, 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 the narrative theorists. Um, and here I'm talking uh, like, uh, of, of people like uh, Harold Bloom, who say that there, there are a limited number of stories that, that we tell in, in the Western canon. Um, in agency theory, it's man versus the organization. Who has the power, the control there? Contingency theory, it's the organization versus the environment. Institutional theory, it's organization versus the society of organizations. Sustainability theory is this argument that the real environment is, is, is striking back on us. Again, there are a number of ways that you can dissect the, the meta narratives of the various theories that we, that we go through. But there, there is, uh, and this takes us back to the religious element of this, there is an implicit normative or moral statement in, in all of these uh, uh, stories. Agency theory is about uh, 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 greed and sloth, I guess you would say. Uh, and you, know, and we, we, you, could, you could do the same with, with uh, all of those. What that means is that even though we make aspirations to be secular in our theories, when we're talking about theories in social theory, there is an implicit normative element to it that there is an inherent tendency towards secularizing things uh, in management that uh, are, are not necessarily uh, as, as secular as, as we, might, uh, we might think. So if, if you look at the, the way that the theory of the professions changed when it moved from, from uh, sociology into uh, management theory, um, it, it, it is actually quite hit, interesting because the, 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 the conversation of professions started out as a very secular conversation. What are the defining elements of the, what are the characteristics? Give me all five characteristics of the profession. A guy named Greenwood back in 1957, uh, he did that. And then they kept adding um, elements of, of the characteristics of the professions till they, the, the, the whole uh, infrastructure of the theory started to collapse because uh, it looked as though everyone and everything could be a, a, a profession at, at some point. Along comes Andy Abbott, and he changes the nature of the theoretical question. He says, well, defining uh, uh, what the characteristics of a profession are is like trying to define the characteristics of a rapidly changing object. What we need to understand is the broader mechanisms by, by which they change. So he came up with this brilliant argument about the, the jurisdictional contestation that occurs between the professions. And he, and he basically stopped the conversation in sociology about profession because it was um, in, in, in many respects, the, the, the right answer. Um, and, and that process of going through property process and, and, and perception of the professions uh, started over again when uh, professions moved into uh, management theory. And we started calling it professional, uh, professional service firms. And uh, the first papers were, what are the property elements of professional service firms and how are they different from others? And then we start getting into this conversation, just like uh, we had in sociology, 
uh, well, maybe we can't delineate all of these. They're, they're kind of starting to blur together. So we now start talking about uh, processual elements of, uh, of professional service firms. This reinforces uh, not only Abbott's notion of fractal knowledge uh, as, it, as, it, uh, as it moves or transforms from one knowledge discipline to another, but it also um, emphasizes this notion of apophatic theory, uh, which again is a, a term that comes from, from religion. When we start to try and understand metaphysical subjects, we can't understand them fully by saying what their characteristics are because they aren't observable in an empirical way. We can only achieve the knowledge by negation, by, by what it is not. And perhaps the most brilliant statement of what theory is, is the statement by Sutton and Stahl in ASQ in 1985 of what theory is not. Uh, Sutton and Stahl, either intentionally or um, very, very cleverly, intuitively, were making a, a form of reasoning that we now understand to be apophatic. Of, of theorization. Alchemical theory pursues epistemic humility, not uh, certainty. So one of the challenges that we have as a profession when we aspire to uh, acquire scientific knowledge is that we're trying to understand uh, 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 an object of inquiry in a way that gives us some degree of certainty, some degree of, of truth. But the difference of, between what we're studying and what uh, scientists study is that the objects of, of study in science, let's take uh, the example of, of uh, geology, uh, rocks don't change as fast as the information that we generate about rocks do. And, and similarly, the, the information that we generate about rocks isn't really absorbed by the rocks and, and changed as, as a result of that. So, um, Apophatic theology understands this, this absolute difference between human reality and uh, divine reality, and an absolute difference between um, the knowledge of the world, uh, the epistemic knowledge, and uh, realizes that human reality exists somewhere between the epistemic knowledge of the world and the knowledge of, of, of the divine. So our knowledge is contingent on a vast universe of, of what it is that we don't know, which we understand as, as epistemic humility. Now, the, the um, American pragmatist John Dewey observed that our efforts towards certainty through empirical knowledge really actually only subverts true knowledge because the objects of inquiry tend to change. And they tend to change very, very quickly when the object of inquiry is human behavior. Uh, he, he points out that if knowledge is dependent on a complete correspondence between uh, knowledge and its true meaning and what is real, then the only knowledge that we can have is knowledge of things that are completely fixed and unchanging. And he argues there are actually very, very few of, of those things. Consider, even though we decry the lack of impact of management knowledge on, on business practice, um, consider Consider the effect that that um, oh gosh, con consider the effect that derivative theory had on the markets. It had a devastating effect on the markets and and, and caused uh, in in many respects the, the the 2008 market crash. Consider the effect that Porter's five forces has the knowledge of that has on human behavior and strategy. There's absolutely no question that strategy changes. As, as, a, as a result of the knowledge that uh, we uh, produce and, and, and educate our, our business students with. Um, perhaps the, 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 the best statement of, of the effect that our knowledge has on the objects of inquiry that, that, uh, that we are studying is uh, by Don McKenzie's wonderful book, uh, uh, it, it is a, 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 sorry, an, an engine, not a mirror, in his description of the, the generation of financial knowledge and its, its devastating effects on the, on the world eco economy in the uh, early 2000s. So if we pursue a, an object of epistemic humility, and that means an understanding that the objects of our inquiry are constantly changing, we shouldn't be as worried about this chart as we tend to be. We shouldn't be as worried about the reapplication of old theories 
in, in a systematic way uh, because the objects of our inquiry change over time. In the same way that we don't worry about the differences in, we don't worry about the fact that historians produce a, uh, a biography of Winston Churchill every five years or so. Why is that? Because our understanding of the past changes in an ever moving present. And our understanding of these old theories actually changes in an ever moving present in the same way, because the objects of inquiry change as a direct result of our knowledge uh, about the, the object. So alchemical theory aspires to wisdom, not knowledge. And, and we, we, we have um, currently this, this euphoria in, um, in science and, and uh, I, I suspect in, in, in management theory that big data will, will solve all of our problems. Um, I'm, I'm mindful of the, the phrase often attributed to, I'm skeptical of this uh, uh, assertion. I'm, I'm mindful of the, the um, observation attributed to Ron Coase that um, piles and piles of, of uh, data are, um, are, are just uh, data in uh, waiting around for, for a theory or, or a fire. But the, but the power of big data particularly is, and, and perhaps ironically, its, it's biggest threat is um, on, on the scientific method. Uh, this is a, a, a series of statements taken about the power of big data from, from Wired magazine. And, and the, the core argument that they're making here is that um, it used to be that even scientific uh, approaches to generating knowledge required theory. We had theory, we created hypotheses, and we tested them. Big data allows us to subvert that process, get rid of the theory, and just randomly test things until we find correlations, not, not causal relationships, but correlations that, that uh, make sense and have practical use. Uh, so they say, Google conquered the advertising world with nothing more than um, applied mathematics. It didn't pretend to know anything about the culture and conventions of advertising, just assumed that it had better data with better analytic tools and that would win the day, and they were right. Google can translate languages without actually knowing it. Uh, correlation is just enough. The practical example of this is the shotgun gene sequencing by G. Craig Vender, Venter, uh, enabled by high-speed sequencers and supercomputers that statistically analyze the data they produce. Venter went from sequencing the individual organisms to sequencing entire uh, ecosystems. Uh, in the process, he discovered thousands of previously unknown species, bacteria, and, and other life forms. So, so interestingly, the big, the big data approach has um, uh, kind of sounded the death knell uh, for scientific ways of, of knowing, but it doesn't, in my opinion, and in fact may elevate the, 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 the importance of the alternative ways of knowing that, that we just described. That is to say that that um, if this knowledge through random search, uh, search and error uh, correlational studies um, is a problem, it's really only a problem for the empirical world, for the real world. And it has, um, it has less to say, and in fact may elevate the, the legitimacy of what we know about the human world or the, the, the metaphysical world. And so, I, I just want to, to, to go back to, and I'm gonna wrap up here and I wanna, I wanna hear what your, your thoughts are about this, uh, this process and hopefully we can have a, a good conversation about it. But I wanna go back to this, this, this notion of, of, of why theory. And, and theory is important because it, it, it has a statement of, of um, a normative statement, I suppose, uh, because it defines what we value as, as knowledge. And values, uh, like, uh, like our profession, are, are a form of syncretic ways of knowing. Their values are stuck between the brute empirical reality of the way the world is and the human aspirations and ideals that we have uh, for, for knowledge or values, uh, that is the way the world should be. And, and that's the beauty of this syncretic profession, that we have a, a knowledge mandate that mediates between knowing the way the world it is and knowing the way the world 
it ought to be. That is our knowledge mandate. That is our, our strength as a profession. And we shouldn't be embarrassed about it. We should, uh, we should embrace it. We should celebrate it. I'm, I'm going to stop talking now. And I, I would like to uh, hear your reaction, comments, challenges, anything like that. Thank you, Roy. Thank you for these insights. Um, it would be helpful if you would like to ask a question or make a comment, um, if you could just raise your hand and that way um, I will call you out. Uh, that way it will be easier for us to have the conversation. You can also, if you're not able to unmute yourself, you can um, post your question in the, in the chat and myself or Emel um, will read it out to Roy. Whilst um, people are processing what you just said, Roy, um, perhaps I could go first, so that's okay. Um, I was really intrigued by, by your idea of um, you know, bringing philosophy and, and theology uh, into this conversation. Um, and in a way, um, both, of, both of them also try to explain how things work um, and how we should or could act in this world. I mean, I'm just thinking, for example, from top of my head, you know, Seneca's work on the shortness of life. Um, Seneca makes a lot of observations about power and being in the position of responsibility. And then he writes to his friend, you know, how to behave or act differently based on the insights uh, of, of the observation. Um, what, what can we learn from, from philosophy and, and even theology uh, in terms of, you know, how we think about management research or management practice or management education, considering that neither of them are particularly overly driven by theory in the same way that management research is. That's a, that, that's, that's a, a brilliant observation. Let me go back and, and point out that uh, Seneca is the perfect example because of course, Seneca was a politician and, and a warrior and in, in many cases uh, exemplifies the idea of, of uh, uh, syncretic knowledge uh, because he, he moves over the course of his career uh, from having uh, incredible technical knowledge to becoming a philosopher basically. And uh, that, that, that really speaks uh, absolutely directly to the problems that we have in, in, in business education. And we, we've had our own fractal moment in business education because of course, um, and, and this is well uh, recounted in, in Piranha's book, uh, we, we start out as, as kind of this old boys club for uh, training, uh, training the, the sons and daughters of business people to go back into the, 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 the family business. Uh, over time, there is a, a critique that starts to emerge in the 1950s that we're not scientific enough uh, so we become uh, scientific. In fact, we become so scientific that we uh, drain out all of the all of the, uh, the, the the humanist education that we once had in in in, uh, in business schools, and um, uh, become uh, almost purely a a, a technical uh, school. And and of course now the pendulum is 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 swinging back. That. Uh, that I, I, I think the, the, the technical component of business schools probably reached its uh, apex in the late 1980s with the aphorism that, that greed is good. And uh, our goal is to uh, train uh, individuals to, to become incredibly wealthy. I know when I did my MBA, um, everyone was there because they wanted to be uh, rich. Uh, now I see people coming into business schools uh, for the exact opposite reason. They, they see management education as a way to change the world. They see knowledge of organizations as a way to change the world. And uh, so we are, we are uh, our, at least our, our consumer base is, is slipping into uh, the, uh, the, the other side of the syncretic equation uh, and the business schools are, are slowly uh, trying to catch up. My concern of course is that, and, and this is the, the, the problem with fractal knowledge, is that the pendulum will swing too far the other way. And pretty soon we will abandon the technical components of our education and uh, it, it will all be about uh, value signaling and, and uh, normative behavior. And we're, we're possibly coming close to that, that, that point now. Um, but but uh, the, 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 the example of, of Seneca is a good one that over the, over the course of uh, 
of our individual lives and over the course of the lives of the institutions that we inhabit, we, we, tend, to, we tend to vacillate between those, those two different ways of knowing. I hope that answers your question. It was a, a long-winded one. I see uh, uh, Alicia, you, you have your hand up. Yes, hi, uh, I'm a PhD student and I'm just, uh, my question is, do data and beliefs create theory? Because you talked about religion and data, so I'm just wondering that. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting combination. Um, so on the, on the data side, you have uh, the, the, the empirical component, the hard science component, and, and uh, beliefs are the, the, the more normative component. And there uh, are a lot of uh, philosophers of science who are much, much smarter than I that say, absolutely, there is no such thing as pure unmitigated objective data that we all bring our, uh, our particular uh, uh, biases and, and different ways of knowing uh, to interpret that, that, that data. And uh, that, that, of course, is the, the basis of uh, both uh, reflexivity in knowledge and the basis of epistemic humility in knowledge. And, and it is that absolute ideal um, combination of those different ways of knowing that, uh, that, that we need to have. But let me, let me add a, a, a little bit of, um, of uh, personal experience uh, to, to uh, reinforce that, that point. Uh, so here, here at the University of Victoria, in our business school, uh, we, uh, we are on the very west coast of Canada. In, in Canada, we have uh, a fairly large indigenous population. Uh, and on the west coast, because of the pattern of colonization, uh, many of the, the First Nations here have not had their, their rights extinguished. So they, they have a degree of political autonomy here that perhaps isn't as strong as in Australia mm -hmm. or in uh, New Zealand, but 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 uh, they they have they have something to bring to the, the ways of knowing, and so we have uh, encouraged a a, um, a a process of hiring indigenous academics in the business school in an effort to decolonize our our, our knowledge. We understand that uh, just as you know um, our our understanding of uh, the evolution of scientific knowledge is profoundly based on the Western canon and goes all the way back to the Greek tradition. Um, what is it that the indigenous peoples have, the First Nations people have? What kind of different approaches to theory can they bring for us? We're, we're very, very interested in, in, in that question. Um, and, and, and I think that, that um, having an indigenous perspective will go a long way, Alicia, to uh, uh, addressing that question of what is the intersection between hard objective knowledge and, and subjective beliefs. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, Fabricio. Well, I believe that's Juliana first. Oh, okay, yes. Okay, on my screen, yes. Juliana. Thank you, thank you, Fabricio. Thank you, Professor Sudabi. Uh, I actually, uh, wanted to talk a little more about uh, data without the conceptualization of knowledge means uh, it is also social constructed. So the data, big data without the contextualization means nothing. I really love the phrase that you can actually hurt, ex squeeze the data and they can say anything. And mm -hmm. One thing also adding to the decolonization, uh, I would like to know your suggestion for, for example, I'm from Brazil and it's very hard to, to produce uh, uh, research here. And even then I'm moving to United States, it's still very hard to fight with this decolonization that has and how you would uh, advise or tell me how can I, promote even more that uh, the knowledge is social constructed even in a positive and colonialist uh, environment and how we can change that along with everything that you mentioned in this in, in this webinar but do you have uh, other insights to share with someone that like me that are studying in academia. And I, I believe that everything could be social constructive and it, it, it has 
you can give different meanings, use rhetorical narratives to, to change it, but it, it is still very hard to, to meet someone that matches with what I say. Yeah, that, that's a, a, again, a, a, too prof well, a profound comment and, a, and, a, and, an, and an excellent question. Let, let me first go back to your comment about uh, the, the, the often used statement that if we torture the data enough that we can get it to say uh, any, anything we, we want. Uh, absolutely, there is, there is, there is no, no, no question to that. And again, uh, many people smarter than me have, have talked about that. But, but we're, we're starting to see the reality of, of that in uh, not just in, in science or in academia, but it has drifted out into, into the world. And, and we, we see it in the contestation of, of facts that uh, right now we, we have a, a political crisis occurring in, in the United States where there is uh, the, the, um, uh, the contestation o o over whether an election was, was legitimate or, or was it stolen? And the objective facts don't seem to make any difference in that. And in fact, uh, the, the US Congress is now starting to elect uh, members of the House of Representatives who uh, have based their entire political career on denying uh, obvious facts. Uh, we, we tend to think of, of facts as being objective knowledge, but um, there, there is, there is perhaps the best example of the contestation of objective facts occurs in the contestation that we have over history now. Um, is, is the interpretation of history that we have accurate or is the interpretation of history part of an agenda of old white men to uh, have a particular view of, of history? And um, there's, there's absolutely no, no question that, that facts get institutionally forgotten over time, sometimes purposely. So I made that point in the, in the description of how we celebrate Sir Isaac Newton. He's a scientist. Yeah, he was a scientist, but he was also an alchemist. We, we have to erase that part because alchemy is bad and, and science is, is good. So yes, there is a normative element to everything and everything has uh, 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 an element of meaning that can be socially constructed. I, I, I agree with that. Your other point, though, is is a is a good one, and it and there's it's a more practical one, and that is that you have this ambition to take a form of knowledge that has been delegitimated or has become forgotten or that is a kind of a secret knowledge and try and make it legitimate. And how do you do that in an institutional context? How do you do that? To put it in very pragmatic words, how do you introduce a new controversial subject into an academic management journal? that has as its criteria that you need to enter an existing conversation. How do you do that when there is no existing conversation? And that is a, that is a question of institutional work. It's, it's very, very hard. I'll give you an example, and, and I'll, 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 I'll tell you what you need to do from my perspective, and, it, and, it, and it's, it's actually quite hard, but it is a form of institutional work. When I was the editor of AMR, I got this paper from uh, some uh, uh, historians that uh, had, uh, it, was a, it was a very interesting paper, it was very well written, um, but it had data in it, it had historical data in it. And I, I wrote to the editor, or to the authors and said, why are you sending this to me? You should be sending it to AMJ because it's, and, and they said, well, we, we sent it to AMJ, but they rejected it because they said it's history, there's, there's no data there. This is a, a debate over wh what is objective fact, and it is a question of how you legitimate a subject history in a, in a context where there is no uh, existing conversation. Um, so uh, that has been my own personal project. And what you have to do is um, the, the same thing that um, the strategy as practice folks have done, the same thing as the sustainability folks have done, you need to find your people. You need to organize conferences and workshops. You need to take the numbers that you attract to those conferences and workshops and start organizing special issues in journals. And those special issues in journals have to move the conversation up the status hierarchy that we have of, of journals until it becomes a conversation. Um, and, and that takes a high degree of deliberation and, and, and work. But you are very energetic, I can tell, and you're extremely young. Uh, the project will take some time, 
but but I would I would strongly encourage you to do that. I'm trying actually, and in the family business, and I was in, disencouraged to do that in the special issue that you were also the editor. It's about history, and every scholar that I talked said, "No, you're crazy," mm. and I said, "No, I'm, I'm not." But, but, but it, it, it does take time, and it takes uh, it takes. Uh, uh, it, it takes people, it takes a, a, a large number of people to bring in the conversation. It, it, is, it is stunning to me that family businesses, uh, which comprise in Canada more than half of the GDP, um, are, are not considered a legitimate topic. Yes, I, I even said that it's ahistorical and it needs to be historical and it needs to be rhetorical, but I'm not... Uh, um, um, I think I, I think the time is coming. There there is a new special issue in in uh, the uh, family business uh, journal. So uh, yes, send your um, paper there. Yes, I will. I will. Okay, great. If, it, uh, if my, my supervisor uh, agrees. <laughs> uh, more institutional work with your supervisor. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> but thank uh, you, Fabricio. So Thanks, Professor. Thanks for sharing your ideas with us. Well, um, in, my, in many occasions and many situations, scholars and management scholars use concepts to explain their abstract ideas. And uh, in, in followery scholars would use those best concepts to, to, to inform new social problems. And uh, this might legitimate, them, legitimate the, the old concepts. So my question is, uh, are all or are, are all concepts theory? Or if not, when a concept is a theory? Or even when the, or, uh, they are only a tool for theorizing? Yeah, that's, a, again, another uh, excellent question that actually builds on the, the, the question that uh, Alicia had. And that is, if, if, we, if we think of the elevation from uh, brute facts to abstract theory, what, what, are, the, what are the stages between those? And, and uh, it, does, does, every, does every abstract, sorry, does every brute fact have a theoretical component to it, and and I, I would I would suggest that uh, I, again I, I think uh, uh, Alicia answered this a little bit. Um, we we cannot we cannot define a fact without a theory be, before it. That even even the the most rudimentary fact, and and this isn't me talking. This is this is uh, Dewey and and uh, American pragmatism. That that there there is there is no there is no fact independent of some form of value judgment uh, uh, along the way. What counts as a fact is in itself uh, a, a value judgment. But the, the more interesting element of your question is, is how we move from an accumulation of facts to, uh, to questions or statements of, of, of abstract theory. And um, this, this is going to sound uh, particularly weird, uh, but the, the, the facts have to exist in a, in a narrative. There has to be a narrative structure. There has to be a story that holds the facts together. So, so even, even the description, um, if, if you look at the, the uh, er, early atomists in, in Greek theory, their, their entire story was about explaining the, the smallest element of, of, uh, of uh, nature. And uh, uh, this this is a, a narrative that has been carried over today to modern physicists who are going to even even smaller types of, of particles that, uh, that that they're using to try to explain the the the, the nature of, of the universe. Um, implicit in that story is a narrative of reductionism of the value of reductionism and and there there is it seems to me since we've been doing playing this exercise for uh, uh, several thousand years, that, that there is an infinite reg regression of, of uh, the, the, the smallest facts available or the smallest unit of, an, of, of analysis available. But to their credit, 
the 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 physicists uh, um, have a story. The 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 the, the basis of uh, their uh, mode of inquiry is to construct new stories about the nature of the world. And so the the distinction between the empirical observation and the theory is 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 dynamic. And and what I mean by that is. I, I, and this is what I love about the, the theoretical physicists, is that they will spend an incredible amount of effort theorizing something that cannot be empirically observed. Dark matter, quarks, they, they can't observe it. But over time, and with uh, millions and millions of dollars, they can build machines that will verify what, what they do. Um, is that a fruitful way of knowing? I, I, I think it is. I, I, I think it, it actually generates knowledge that, that can become useful and practical over the time, uh, or over time. And, and I think the, the same thing is, is true of, of our world. If we can construct a narrative that explains something, um, then we can muster the facts to it. And, and this is quite the opposite of the scientific method, which starts from data observation absent of a, a, a theory. Personally, I think that's impossible. I, I hope that answered your question. It was, a, I, 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 I could go on about that subject, but I, I suspect there may be other questions. Appreciate it. Good, good to see you again, Fabricio. Any other okay, questions? Bro. Should I be looking in the... Uh, yeah, we have some questions in the chat. Roy, I'm just gonna read out some of them. Um, okay. I'll start with Daniel's question, which we, he's, he asked early on while he was still talking um, during your presentation. Daniel's asking, Roy, when you say that theories are all stories, i.e. that they can be articulated as narratives, I guess, do you imply that all causal explanation is a story? It seems to me that explanation is a more primitive concept than story. That's a that's a, a a good question. I'd like <coughs> I'd like to <coughs> hear um, his uh, Daniel's uh, elaboration of that. But uh, yes, I, I I stand by the the, the statement that all all uh, theories are are stories. And again, it's no it's no accident that the um, the uh, Greeks uh, told stories uh, about the gods traveling over the cosmos uh, that allowed them to navigate around the world. That 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 is a uh, the useful application of a story to a practical uh, uh, outcome. Uh, was it absolutely accurate? No, but was it uh, practically accurate? A absolutely it was. So the, the narrative element of uh, theory, I think is, is absolutely critical. And it's, it's critical because um, uh, again, going back to the uh, Sutton and Staw paper, uh, they're, they're making this apophatic argument that um, theory is, uh, and, and they say, well, we can't tell you what theory is, but we can tell you what it's not. It's not data. It's not causality. It's not. It's all of these these uh, these these elements together. And uh, I, I I agree with that that uh, that that element of it. Uh, that you need uh, you need to take all those component parts of theory and put it together in a in a in a sense of coherence. And the coherence absolutely comes from from the narrative, even. Even uh, and and in in the context of of uh, storytelling, there there is this um, uh, competition that exists amongst uh, amongst storytellers about uh, reductionism in stories. What is the simplest story that that you can tell? Um, and uh, the, the 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 story of about this reductionist story is that Hemingway actually uh, won this contest with a. Um, and, and Google it. Uh, it it's a, a, a five a five word story um, that that can be compressed. That that that's what we do as 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 theoreticians. We are asked to to put together a a a, a sense of coherence in a narrative that can be as small as box A, box B, with an arrow between them. That is that is the reductionist story that we have about theory. And, and the, the, the critics of the grand theory that we have uh, say that maybe we should just go back to these, these uh, uh, hypothesized causal relationships. 
I, I, I don't entirely disagree with that, but I don't think the box A and box B is the only way to, to, uh, to tell a theoretical narrative. There are, there are other types of narratives out there that we need to study. Um, I, I don't know if I answered that, uh, Daniel, but if not, please, uh, please raise your hand. I, I see another hand by uh, Wei Gang. Hi, Roy. Good to see you again. Yeah, good uh, I'm you. from uh, yeah, good, I'm from uh, actually say Montreal uh, here in Canada. Uh, your uh, thank you very much for this uh, webinar, which is uh, huge. I mean, this uh, the content is so uh, so rich. Uh, please correct me if my understanding is wrong. So, generally speaking, you are um, conveying to us an idea that uh, we should approach doing research more from a holistic approach than from a reductionist approach. Is, is my understanding correct? That is correct, yes. Okay, so here is my question. Um, because I'm from the OB, the field of OB versus OT. Uh, but given this uh, excessive careerism, you know, uh, publish or perish, you know, this uh, all the first priority being always put in the productivity. You know, you should publish certain numbers of paper each year. Uh, how can a junior researcher or scholar pursue a really, pursue some research topic that he or she is passionate about? I'm asking this question because this excessive careerism uh, can and do hurt one's passion for research. You know, um, just to give you some, just to give you some more information. So here, when I'm trying to do some, you know, to cover some broader research topic, which borders on OT, and then some senior researchers or scholars tell me, Samuel, don't do that. Don't do that. Avoid reading OT stuff. But in my heart, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm yelling, you know, I'm, uh, uh, but that's interesting. I'm, I'm reading more than OT stuff, even some historical stuff, you know, religious stuff, blah, blah, blah. But I know they, they mean me no harm because they care about my survival in academia. So sorry for this, uh, my, my, sorry for my uh, digression. So my question is, uh, given this, uh, you know, publish or perish reality in the, in the academia, how can a uh, junior researcher approach research, his or her uh, research from a holistic uh, approach? Uh, is my question clear? I'm sorry. It, it, just, it, it, is, yeah. it, is, it is clear. It is a profoundly existential question for uh, junior people in academia. And I, I, I really, really thank you for, for raising that, that, that question because it, is, um, it, it, it touches on all the institutional constraints we have on generativity in, in uh, knowledge production. When I was, uh, uh, let, let me tell you my, my, my background. Um, what I love about your question is that it, it, uh, it, it, it really talks about the role of, of the theorist as an alchemist in, in a way. Alchemists had to have secret knowledge and it sounds as though you're going to have to have a secret project that you, that you develop. But, but um, I'll, I'll tell you my narrative in, in a minute, but I, I, wanna, I wanna clarify the, the um, the answer before I go into that. The, the, the answer is that you uh, absolutely need to feed your, your passion or uh, academia will become a wasteland for you. Th this, is a, this is a marathon, not a sprint. And, and we're, we're trained to do things in, in, in sprint formation. You need to do this to get a publication. You need to do this to get tenure. You need to do this to get promoted to full. And if you sacrifice your passion for that, uh, you'll probably be uh, successful in a, in a disciplinary way, uh, but you're not going to be very successful in, in a creative way. It, 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 it's no accident that many of the, the uh, Nobel Prize winners 
um, who do incredibly uh, holistic interdisciplinary work are often fail to get tenure at, at their home institutions. One, one of the more uh, recent ones, a, 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 a Canadian, uh, by the way, is the, uh, I think she was only the, the, the woman from Waterloo whose name uh, escapes me, only the third woman to uh, receive the Nobel Prize in, in physics, still an associate professor. She's doing world creating work, but she is not publishing at the, at the pace that people want. And she's not publishing within the, the constraints of the discipline. So people, she's not engaging in a conversation that people recognize. So uh, they, 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 they succeed um, in the knowledge production game, but they don't succeed in the institutional careerist game, uh, unfortunately. So, so the answer is that you, you need to succeed in both of these games. Uh, in, in the OB world, uh, my, my answer uh, for that or my icon of the absolute alchemist is the, uh, the, the career of Carl Weick. Carl Weick started out like you, and he published early on in his career in the disciplinary way. He had box A, he had box B, he did all yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, but look at, look at the long game that he played. He maintained his passion in uh, understanding um, elements of cognition that had nothing to do with boxes and, and quantitative uh, yeah. modes of inquiry. So um, wh what you're going to have to do is either take some risks early on in your career or maintain a, 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 an interest, uh, an, an overarching um, um, passion that informs all of the little pieces that, that, that you do moving forward. My, my own personal career, I came to academia fairly, fairly late in, in, in life. So, um, and, and I had no ambitions for uh, a tenure track. I was, a, I was a, a lawyer for a long time. I hated being a lawyer. And uh, uh, I was only too happy to go into the, to the uh, academic world. And so my idea was that uh, when, when I graduated, I would uh, work at a community college, practice a little law on the time, but I would still get to live the, 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 the life of the mind. So I was given opportunities to work on the vroom yetten model. What's the vroom yetten model, you ask? Well, exactly. It doesn't exist anymore. Thank God I avoided that choice. <laughs> I was asked to work on institutional theory, but institutional theory at the time was all about why are organizations all the same? And I, coming from the background in law, I said, well, you know, actually the legal profession is changing quite dramatically at the moment. So I, I did my, my thesis on why institutions change at a time when everyone else was saying they don't change. Um, this is just a matter of luck. It's not prescience. But when I, when I woke up from my dissertation, the world was all talking about why do institutions change. So eventually the world will catch up with you is, is, is my broader argument. Or if it doesn't, then you have to take the, the, uh, the, the approach that uh, I was, the, the institutional work approach of finding your people and, and, and making that, that, that knowledge relevant. That's a much longer game. But um, my, my advice to you is that um, academia is not a lot of fun if you're, if you're just playing the short run game. You, you have to have some passion in what you do. I yes, uh, can, a quick question. Can I sh uh, shoot an email asking more detailed questions? Because I don't want to take up too much of, of the other's time. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's rsadabi at uvic.ca. OK, and, thank and you. I didn't realize that uh, Montreal had palm trees, but good, good for you. <laughs> no, 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 that's visual background. Sorry. OK, thank good you. To, good to see you Talk again. To you. Sure, talk to you. Dolores. Thanks, Roy. Thank you for the talk. I really enjoyed I love your talk today. I find uh, a problematic issue, maybe it's a too philosophical question, but in the, in the way you rise uh, of the concept of theory, which has to do with the relationship within, uh, between the epistemological and the ontological stance. So theory like linked to nous as a capacity in, in Greek philosophy implies seeing the, the thing we translate like intellectus in Latina, uh, intellectual capacity is means that you can see what the things are, understanding that one can know the, the nature of, of things. 
But social scientists and management theory mostly are uh, sub supporting a more contrast contrast uh, contrasted theory, uh, constructing all the concepts. So, which how can you manage this uh, tension between the epistemology and the ontological stance? How can be this reconciled with, with the idea of theory? Yeah, so, so um, I, I don't know that I know the perfect answer to this question. This, this also is a very profound question. And um, the, 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 an the answer according to, to Abbott uh, is, is that methodology is the bridge between, between those two. And the methodological choice that you make uh, should should be the, the the syncretic element that connects the the, the epistemology and, and, and the ontology. I, I'm not I'm not entirely <clears throat> sure that I, I quite understand his his argument on on that context. Um, for, for for me, it, uh, what, what I like about about the the methodology being the the the, the bridge is is that it. Uh, it, it satisfies my leaning toward uh, American pragmatism. Dewey, I think, would say uh, uh, precisely the same thing. But in 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 the in, in your context, I, I know I know your research and I know the methodology that you use. And um, just my my answer would be that there needs to be a narrative coherence between the epistemology and the ontology. And I I think the methodology tends to bring that that together. So I, I know the type of work that you do, which is profoundly phenomenological, and I know that the methodology that you use is um, <clears throat> I would I would describe it as a as a an, a, a very creative um, extension of the researcher as the as the instrument. Um, I, I I think there's coherence in in in, in what you're doing. Um, the, the the thing to avoid and and the thing that gets people in trouble. Is this idea of um, I use the term epistemological slurring, but it's it's when there is a lack of coherence between the epistemology, the ontology, and the methodology, and that and that happens a lot in in our business. It happens a lot in papers that that get published. That uh, again, in in the context of institutional theory, there there is a lot of of uh, argument about social constructivism that uses non-social constructivist methods. To uh, e explore it, and 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 I worry about that. Um, I I think you can get a glimpse of of uh, an argument by having box A and box B uh, with an arrow between it, but but I I don't know that it fully captures the the the, the nature of the, the 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 story. The the other thing that I would I would uh, suggest is that there is a there is a Part of my entire talk is to avoid fundamentalism in, 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 in our research. Uh, funda fundamentalism in theory, fundamentalism in methods, and, and fundamentalism uh, to me refers to having just very, very narrow ways of, of, of knowing things. So there, there is a tendency in our business uh, toward tribalism in epistemology. If you take this epistemological position, you can never vary from it. I disagree with that. I mean, my answer to, to uh, the, the last question was, look at the career of Carl Weick. He has drifted dramatically over his career in his epistemological and his ontological foundations. And in fact, he's made that drift an important part of his theoretical contribution. So um, uh, when, I, when I say that I'm uh, uh, arguing for uh, uh, holism in, in our research, I, I think that I'm also suggesting that you, ju just because you adopt a particular epistemological position now doesn't mean that you can't change that over time. In, in fact, for me, that is the ultimate expression of epistemic humility, that you understand the limitations of the way of knowing, that either you accept them or you're willing to, to uh, try, try other ways of knowing or work with people who have different... Uh, uh, ontological or epistemological positions than you do. I, I know that's not a direct answer to your question, but that's that is the best I can do. And keep and keep in mind, it's uh, it's very early in the morning here, so I, I don't think so well this early. <laughs>
Good, good to see you, Dolores. Uh, Allison. Thanks, Roy. I echo your early morningness, um, Allison House from University of Calgary. We've met briefly before, so good to see you. Thanks for your talk. Um, what you haven't talked much about today, and I'm just curious, either your perspective or any advice really comes down to what does the output look like? Do theory papers perhaps look different now? Like a new, you said you didn't see many new theories. Does the writing style, does the format, um, what might that look like going forward? I'm just really curious of your thoughts uh, on that. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I don't know the answer to that either. Um, I, I do know that there is this tendency, part of our reductionist tendency is toward formulas. Uh, when uh, qualitative methods, you got to have the Gioia chart. That's if you don't have it, you're not legitimate. Uh, in in um, writing a theory paper, you, you need to construct the gap in a certain way. And uh, I I do see elements changing now. And and I have to say that I don't have. So when when I was the editor of AMR, you have kind of a holistic view of of what various people are trying to do in in terms of writing theory. I don't have that anymore. But I do notice that there is a shift away from uh, this reductionist approach of trying to construct a gap. Trying to construct a gap is uh, a, a different form of fundamentalism. It, it is, it is a, a theological approach to, to theory. Institutional theory says this, but I found this small, narrow uh, contradiction, and I'm going to do that. And then someone else comes along and says, well, I found an even smaller. And, and so we, we get into these. Um, uh, navel gazing debates that are uh, akin to conversations about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. I think the field has realized that that is not productive. It, it has us focusing on these internal conversations while we're not keeping pace with what's going on in changes in the world around us. So there is a, a, sh a shift in motivating your paper, not by a gap in theory, but by pointing to an existing phenomenon that, that theory doesn't explain. And I think that's a very uh, fruitful uh, direction because the world is changing very, very rapidly around us. Um, so so that's, that's one small change, but there is still this tendency, uh, which is very restrictive to say that we will only um, uh, accept your paper if you frame it in the context of, of an existing conversation. That, that, is, a, that is a real, problem because it privileges old knowledge over new and it privileges old theory over new and who benefits from that is what you should ask well it's it's old white guys like me that benefit from that because we don't we don't have a mechanism for generating new new theory and and we need to do that um, th there there are efforts in the academy to try and address that so the idea of academy of management discoveries was to have a more a phenomenal based uh, a, 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 a venue for people publishing uh, this, this new uh, material. Um, even there, uh, and despite the best efforts, we still drift toward theory there. We still drift toward old theory because we cannot conceive of a new idea unless we can wrap it around. So, so the, the answer to that is really, really difficult. And, and I think it's that it, it has something to do with the way we write it. You need to we need to develop a mechanism of, um, I, I, again, I'm gonna borrow a, a, a fancy word from religious uh, studies, uh, of apophy, ap apophastic writing. And, and, and that is to um, create a kind of a Trojan horse story where we look like we're writing in institutional theory, but we're saying something else. Or we look like we're writing in contingency theory, but we're making an argument about, about sustainability or all these taboo topics that we're not allowed. To. I, 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 I hate to be so um, uh, uh, pessimistic about that, but, uh, I, and I will tell you that I'm, I'm, I'm putting my, my, my money where my mouth is. I've, I've just, so as you know, the Academy of Management Discoveries is a, a journal devoted to um, public policy, uh, the, the application, the communication that we have uh, with practitioners, and I've, I've just uh, uh, accepted a, 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 an editorial position with the Academy of Management Discoveries because I think that we have a lot to say to policymakers and to government folks, and I don't think that I, I, I do think that our theories get in the in the way of saying that. But but there there are glimmers of hope out there. There is this movement to phenomenon rather than uh, reductionist theory. 
there, there are more venues opening up and, and there is a, an appreciation for the practical application of, of what we do, all of which feeds into this alchemical form of knowledge that I'm, I'm trying to promote. And I do know at the University of Calgary that they are very big on entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship is a, um, uh, an, an area that again has been sort of a, a taboo topic for a long, long period of time that only now is, is starting to, to realize its, uh, its potential. Does that answer your question? Oh, it's great. Thank you. It, it at least elaborates the, um, the tension that there is right now. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, Kay. Oh, oh, it's, oh, it's cool. But the wrong pronunciation is, is okay. Yeah. That's not fun. Cool. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. I, I got, thank you. I got my PhD from University of Alberta in last year. I believe I like, I only have a chance to say hello to you once <laughs> uh, before. So uh, very inspiring and uh, eye opening talk. And uh, I very much enjoy the, uh, like uh, uh, your talk as well as a uh, discussion. Actually, I have kind of three uh, points, a mix of questions and comments. The first is like, uh, I remember like uh, years ago, you wrote like a GMR article your, your, your key point was like in the future, the future of o, OT should be like critical theory. Now, critical theory is sort of like umbrella words. Now, I, um, to, the, to this point, I was a little bit surprised to see in your presentation, you say like we, we probably have, we should embrace uh, the facts and the fashion, but why not critically no, no, criticize the current theory? That, that, that's, that's one puzzle. Second, second question is regarding like you know, your theorization is uh, it's sort of it's sort of like based on you know Greek literature, philosophy, etc., Western civilization. Um, I'm I'm not sure where you are going to stand your paper. You know, to me, if I write this paper, I probably maybe I consider a sort of like agnostic view, you know, to reach a broad audience. Mm -hmm. uh, and the last point uh, I, I was. I, I was kind of interested to know about like uh, 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 about your like a presentation. It seems to be a work in process. Are you going to send it somewhere, or would you mind share like the status of of the current like? Uh, it looks like an AMR paper somehow. <laughs> Thank you. Great, great to see you again, and and. Uh... Uh, uh, thank you for the questions. I'll, I'll answer the last one uh, first. Yes, this is a, a work in progress uh, that is long overdue uh, for an invited piece for organization theory, which is the, uh, the new theoretical um, uh, uh, branch of the org studies group. Um, the, your, your second question um, that wouldn't, uh, is, is an interesting one. Wouldn't taking a, an agnostic view um, uh, build a, a, a broader audience for, uh, for what you do. Um, possibly, I, I suppose. I'm, I'm not so sure that I'm, when I do these things that I'm writing for a, an audience or, or that I'm trying to write for a, a broad audience. I, I think, and, and I'll, I'll give you the uh, analogy again of, of uh, a story writer. Um, what, what, what kind of author would, would you like to be? Would you would you like to be um, the, the uh, author that does Harlequin romances, which have very, very large audiences? Or would you like to be, um, uh, th this is going to sound pretentious, but it, it isn't. Would you like to be John Steinbeck, who is uh, critically acclaimed, but doesn't write for a particularly broad audience? And, and I think personally, I would, I would prefer the latter. And I, th I think that if you, if you try and write for an excessively broad audience, uh, it tends to temper the message that, that the, the, uh, the, the, the sharp point of your ideas gets blunted by the, the, the size of the audience. We see this in the review process where um, I see many papers, I, I see a lot of papers go through the review process and come out as better papers. I, I have to establish that. But I see a lot of very, very provocative papers go through the review process. And because they get reviewed by um, folks that are trying to broaden the audience, it blunts the message of it. And, and so I think that if you want to do uh, something that's important to you personally and something that uh, you, you, you think uh, uh, has a, a, tr a truth statement that, that you need to be true to uh, yourself as, as well as your audience. So I'm. I'm, I'm not sure that I would necessarily take an agnostic view just because I'm worried about the, 
the size of the audience. The, the, the first point that you make is a, is a really good one. And that is that you, and uh, I'm not sure if I understood it, but um, you, you seem to be suggesting that um, I am contradicting myself by uh, uh, my earlier statements about embracing postmodern theory by suggesting that we should embrace the fads and fashions. Well, I, I think that those are entirely consistent with uh, postmodern theory or with critical theory because uh, cr critical theory um, argues against uh, broad narratives of, of knowing or universal ways of knowing. They, they actually suggest that um, the, the um, the idea of uh, progress in knowledge is, uh, uh, at least in the social sciences, is a bit, is a bit of an illusion. And uh, I, I, I agree with that entirely. I, I think, and, and again, it has to do with the change uh, in the, the pace of change in your knowledge needs to reflect the pace of change in the object that you're studying. And we're not studying rocks, we're studying people in very, very dynamic circumstances. And the, the phenomenon is changing very, very rapidly. And our, our knowledge doesn't, doesn't change as rapidly. Particularly, it doesn't change if we uh, try and take a, a, a scientific view of, of, of what we're doing. I'm, I'm not denigrating science. The, the sci part of the holistic argument is that there is a place for scientific knowledge. Ab absolutely no question. All I'm saying is that it is, it is not the only way of, of knowing. I, ho I hope that answers your question, Kip. Where, where are you now? Uh, uh, right now, I, I, I'm in Waterloo. So uh, thank you very much for your answers. Very helpful, very inspiring. Yeah. Thanks. Good, good, good. Hope, hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I too. ML, have I said that right? Yes, yes, you did. Thank you, Professor. Um, I'm monitoring the uh, YouTube questions, and we have a question from Selena that is uh, following nicely from your last comments. So um, she says, if we can change how people behave and think through new theories, then what's the point of showing the predictability of theories as, as they will be always right given enough time and when authorities are supporting these theories? Thank you. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's a great question as well. And it, and it really um, uh, is, is predicated by a question about what, what, is, what, is, the, what is our purpose? Is our, is our purpose just to uh, predict reality or is it to, to change reality? And this, um, I'm sure Selena, will, you will recognize is, is the difference between um, a, a scientific approach to theory versus an action approach to theory. Action theory is really designed to change the world. And um, action theory is uh, uh, commonly used not, not just uh, by a small group of uh, management scholars, as was true uh, a couple of decades ago, but uh, the, the, the idea of uh, engaging in these uh, quasi-natural experiments is now used by our colleagues in, in uh, economics and our colleagues in political science as well. And I'm, I'm actually very, very pleased to see that uh, our, our folks in management, particularly in the context of entrepreneurship, I have to say, are, are engaged in forms of, and, and I would add in, in uh, th those uh, management academics that are working in sustainability, are, are also engaged in, in action research where they go out into the communities and uh, they, they, they try and uh, effect change and study how that, that change happens. This, in a sense, blurs the line between um, uh, theoretical wisdom and practical wisdom in, in an interesting way. Um, but um, I, I, I don't see a, a, a particular problem with that. That is just another way of, of knowing. And it's another way of demonstrating the, the efficacy of, of the knowledge that you produce. Uh, one way is to predict the future. Absolutely, nothing wrong with that. Another way is to make the future, which is the common aphorism that's used in entrepreneurship research. That too is a very, very powerful way of knowing. Um, and I, I think both are expressions of syncretic ways of knowing. I, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, thank you very much. Roy, if I may, um, a question from the chat, um, which Vicky is asking a question related to the idea of Sophia. Um, she says, as someone who 
research is knowledge creation and mobilization within teams and organizations. I was really interested in the idea of epistemic humility. I haven't come across Sophia as a form of knowledge either and wonder where it might be able to read, find out more about that. Well, um, I am not the expert in the audience. I saw I Elena um, in the audience. I I'm not sure if you're still here, Elena, but I know that you know this, this material much better than I do. And if, uh, if you're willing, would you uh, raise your hand so I can see where you are? Uh, I guess she's not here anymore. Elena Antakoplu uh, knows this this material much much better than I do. I, I am not a, I am not an expert on um, on 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 Sophia, but but I am uh, I am very very uh, attentive to this idea of um, of um, epistemic humility, and and that is this this. Um, this false assumption that uh, our form of knowledge is uh, somehow uh, superior or uh, more long lasting or a, a stronger contributor to uh, progression in, in knowledge than, than other ways of knowing. And, and I, I think, and again, we had a, a, a brief conversation about uh, indigenous ways of knowing versus colonial ways of knowing. Um, the, the, there is absolutely no question that we could learn a lot about the environment from our, our conversations with uh, in, in, in our uh, indigenous colleagues. Um, I, 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 I think that the, 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 the best expression of the contingent notions of ways of, of or the contingency of our, our ways of knowing comes in the evolution of our, our theories. And our, and our tendency to turn everything into a form of, of uh, a contingency theory. So, so let's, let's look at it from the um, context of um, uh, strategic management. So the, the epistemic question for strategic management is how is it that we explain superior performance of organizations? Of some org how is it that some organizations are able to consistently outperform uh, other organizations? And much as I described in the context of the theory of professions, we start delineating and we start empirically examining the various characteristics of organizations that, that uh, make them more successful. And at the end of the day, we have a long list of uh, big data in a sense with no serious answers to that question. So, so we move up to uh, 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 another level of analysis for analysis where we say, well, it's not actually uh, what they do, but it's the process by which they're able to adapt to their environment. So there, there are these, um, these th th there is a meta answer to the question, and that is uh, our, our ability to adapt to, to change. Uh, that's the answer. And um, again, we start the process of delineating the component elements of make some firms better able to adapt to change than others. And then we come up with, no, it's really the micro foundations. There are these three categories of micro foundations that determine uh, the, the success of, of organizations. And then we start the process over again of delineating what are the component elements of, of micro foundations. This, this, is not, this is not wisdom and this is not progress in knowledge. This, this is um, a, a blatant, um, inability to understand that there are contingencies out there and there will continue to be contingencies out there that need uh, a, a better uh, and a more meta-analytic form of explanation and, and we're, not, we're not getting there. So my answer to your, to your question, Vicky, is that, is that wisdom comes in trying to come to the conclusion that our standard ways of trying to approach subject areas puts us in these infinite regression cycles of doing the same thing over and over again. And, and that isn't true knowledge, in, in my opinion. That we, we need to understand that there's something else going on there that maybe our approaching uh, epistemology and our uh, approaching view of the world is, is, is just not, not fully addressing. And, and I suspect the answer to that question has something more to do with human nature than the nature of organizations and and their environment. Uh, at, at the end of the story, at the end of the, uh, the, the day, our, our stories are not stories about the world. 
the stories are about us in the world. And we tend to focus very, very heavily on the world and not strongly enough on our role in the world. I hope that answered the question. Okay, I, I, I think we're losing steam here. So I think I'm going to um, uh, wrap up. I, um, I, I again want to uh, thank Ibrat for uh, putting together this, this conversation. And um, I'm gonna spend some time pouring over the chat because I see a lot of, a lot of detailed uh, comments and insightful comments that I'm not going to be able to um, um, fully address now. Um, but I would invite uh, those of you who have uh, uh, ongoing conversations that you want to, to have with me to just, uh, just shoot me an email and we can maintain the, maintain the conversation. Or maybe we'll organize another one. It's, 